Good evening and welcome to Pace IT's webinar, weekly webinar. Tonight we will be talking about CompTIA's A plus exam 220-801 and I will be covering exam objective 2.3. I'm Brian Farrell. I am the certificate mentor for PSIT's TNI program, their technology and integration support program. I am also a instructor for Edmonds Community College for their uh, CIS 205 class, which surprisingly enough just happens to be uh, a and TNI program. So you're probably wondering what exam objective 2.3 is of the 801, excuse me, the 220-801 exam. It is titled Properties and Characteristics of TCP IP Addresses. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into uh, TCP IP addressing. So where do we start? Well, we start with Internet Protocol version 4 or IPv4. It is a binary addressing scheme that's used for networking and it was finalized in 1981. IPv4 is the most common network addressing scheme that is deployed today. Uh, probably not for much longer, but we'll get to that later. Well, actually, we'll kind of get to it right now because there is an issue with IPv4. Because of its structure and the growth and popularity of the Internet, most of the world has run out of assignable IPv4 addresses. As a matter of fact, I, last I heard, there was only about a week or two left of available IPv4 addresses. And those were getting really expensive and hard to come by even at that. But thanks to some forethought by some various organizations, IPv4 is still actually valid today. So let's talk about it a little bit more. IPv4 actually works at layer three of the OSI model. That is the network layer. And the OSI model OSI stands for Open System Interconnection, and it is a reference model that is used that actually allows for disparate computing systems to be able to communicate together. It's broken up into seven layers. You can see it there to your right, with layer three being the network layer, which happens to deal with the logical addressing of networks and nodes. IPv4 is a binary, 32-bit uh, binary addressing scheme. That means that there are 32 digits to it. Those 32 digits are broken into four octets. Each octet is eight bits. You'll notice there to the right, I've got it broken down into four octets. And those octets can be represented by zeros and ones. For human readability, we do oh, no, we do break that down into dotted decimal. I guess I'll get to that later. And you're probably familiar with that. That would be like your 192.168.0.1 address. With IPv4, there are theoretically 4,294,967,000 possible individual addresses. That's because binary is uh, base two counting. So if it's 32 bits, that's two to the 32nd power, which gives us that over four billion possible addresses. So let's talk about the address structure. Some of the bits make up your logical network address. I like to think of that as my home address. And some of those bits make up the logical host host portion of the address. So that would be like your name. So when you get that 
package or that letter in your mailbox that's addressed to you. Your physical address would be like your network address and your name could correlate to the host address. So we're dealing with, we are dealing with a binary number, zeros and ones. So how can we tell which part is which? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, we use a device that is called a subnet mask to, to actually determine which part is which, which part is the network, and which part is the host. The way the subnet mask works is it too is a 32-bit binary number, and it uses two methods of being represented. One is the dotted decimal that we're used to, and the other is through what's called classless interdomain routing and that's a topic for a different webinar. If you look to the right, you will see that uh, IP address of 24.113.185.118. That's represented by the top binary number. Down below it, you see a subnet mask of 255.0.0.0. Um, that is the subnet mask, and if you look at that, and you write it out, you'll see that we have one octet, the octet that's all the way on the left, that is nothing but ones, and then everything else is a zero. So any portion of that IPv4 address up above, which is covered by ones in the subnet mask, makes up the logical network portion of the address. The other portion, the part that wouldn't be covered by ones, or is covered by zeros, makes up the host portion. So in, in the above example, the network address is actually 24. Technically, when you write that out, that would be 24.0.0.0. And the host address portion is the 113.185.118. So there you have this address structure, and there you have the subnet mask. Now, IPv4 has been divided into classes of addresses. You will, you will sometimes hear that um, classful addressing is no longer valid. Uh, that's true to an extent, but we still have to learn it for various reasons. So the first one that we need to talk about is the class A address. Class A addresses always have a subnet mask of 255.0.0. That gives us 256 possible numbers for the class A network, or 256 possible class A networks. And that's because it would be 2 to the 8th power, which is 256. That gives us an address range of 0, .0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0.0.0 up through 127.255.255.255. Then there are class B addresses. They always have a subnet mask of 255.255.0.0. And that gives us 65,536 possible class B networks because that would be 2 to the 16th power, which gives us that 65,536. Oh, something I forgot to tell you about class A, but we'll, I'll start with class B and then loop back up. The first octet of the IP address for a class B address always begins with a 1, 0, and then the other 6 can be zeros or 1s. It doesn't really matter. When we were talking class A, the first digit is always a zero. The other, other seven digits could be anything. Either ones or zeros, doesn't matter. Then there are class C addresses, which always have a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. That gives us that gives us 16,777,216 possible Class C networks. The first octet of a Class C address always begins with a 110, 
and the other five digits can be just about anything. Well, the zeros, zeros are one. That gives us a possible address range of 192.0.0.0 up through 223.255.255.255. Finally, we have Class D addresses. Now, Class D addresses do not use a subnet mask. Class D addresses actually have a specific purpose, and that is for multicast uh, network transmissions, which again is a topic for a different webinar. The first octet in the class D address always begins with 1110, with the other four digits being whatever combination of zeros and ones they care to be. That gives us a possible address range of 224.0.0.0 up through 239.255.255.255. There are actually Class E addresses. You don't have to learn them. Uh, class E addresses are used for research and experimentation. Now that we learned about the classes of address, now we're going to talk about um, public IPv4 and private IPv4. Public IPv4 addresses are routable. They are what can be routed across the internet. And without some me special mechanism in place, specifically private IPv4 addressing, all IPv4 addresses would need, would be public addresses and would need to be unique. We would be in trouble. We would have run out of IPv4 addresses a long time ago. Um, but thankfully, they came up with private IPv4 addressing, that, and it was specifically used as a mechanism to conserve IPv4, the IPv4 address space. Private IPv4 addresses are non-routable. The, the IPv4 addresses cannot pass through a router's interface at least not out onto the public internet. Uh, IPv4 addresses are only relevant to their own local networks. That means that they're only significant within their own network. But even there, they need to be unique uh, in order for IP addressing to work. So I just talked a little bit about private IPv4 addresses. Oh, there's my private sign. I forgot to throw that up there for you. So let's talk about private IPv4 addresses. There are three main pools. They kind of correspond to the class A, class B, and class C networks. And it's up to the network administrator, or you, to determine which of those address pools and subnet masks you're going to use. So let's run through those pools, and I'm going to do this quickly. It's a little bit dry. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. First up is what I would call a Class A private IPv4 address. And those always begin with a 10. And you could have any address range from 10.0.0.0 up through 10.255.255.255. But you always have to have a minimum subnet mask of 8 bits. So at the minimum, you will always have a 255.0.0.0. By default, it provides a single Class A network with over 16 million host addresses. You can use that one. Um, I've used them. Uh, I never use a, a Class A private IP address with the default subnet mask. I always increase the mask size just because it's easier to deal with. 
Next up is the what I would call a Class B IPv4 address, even though it's not really a Class B. And you'll see why in a moment. But with a class with this class B, you get anywhere from 172.16.0.0 up through 172.31.255.255, and it always has a minimum subnet mask of 12 bits. That's why it's not really a class B. So at the minimum, it always has a 255.240.0.0. And if you look at that representation down below, the first octet is full of ones. The second octet is half full of ones, and the rest of it is zeros. So that doesn't match, truly match the class B, but that's the easiest way to think of it. So by default, it provides 16 networks with over 1 million addresses available for hosts. Now, when I'm creating an addressing scheme, for some reason, I never use this class of addresses. Don't know why, just personal preference. And the last pool, which you can think of as a class C, uh, you can have an address range of 192.168.0.0 up through 192.168.255.255 with a minimum subnet mask of 16 bits. And so it's not all, it can't actually be classified as a class C, but that's the easiest way to think of it. So its subnet mask is always at the minimum 255.255.0.0. And there's the binary representation down there below. And by default, you get 256 class networks with this and uh, with a possible 65,536 addresses available for hosts. Now when I'm doing an addressing scheme or creating a network, I always tend to pick on that 10.0.0.0 uh, .0 address range and the 192.168 address range. Personal preference, like I said before, I never use the 172. I will let you know that for the exam, you need to memorize these address ranges. You don't necessarily need to memorize their default subnets, subnet masks, but you do need to know and be able to recognize the default address ranges. Something to remember is if a number is greater than 255, so if you see like a 256, that ain't happening. That's not a valid address. Just a hint for you. Keep it in mind. So now let's talk about methods of assigning IP addresses. There are three methods. First off, there's manually. The network administrator assigns each host with its own address. Works really great if you have like 10 or fewer devices on your network, but it gets really unwieldy really fast. In today's modern networks, it probably would not work at all. Well, it, it, it would work. It would just be such a big pain in the butt that nobody would really want to do it. Uh, next up would be you could... Um, Assign your IP address using a service like DHCP, or Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. This is the most common method of assigning IP addresses. So your IPv4 address is configured onto a device that acts as a DHCP server. When your devices come online, they send a request to the DHCP server, and it provides all the information that your hosts need to receive their IPv4 configuration. As in, they will get their IPv4 address, their subnet mask, they will be informed where the default gateway is located, and more than likely, they will also receive information on where to locate 
a DNS server or a domain name system server. The third method of assigning an IP address is using a PIPA, A-P-I-P-A. -P -I -P -A. That's a mouthful. This is where your host automatically assigns its own IPv4 address using a PIPA. So it self-selects its address. So let's talk about a PIPA. The PIPA address pool is always, well, is always, always ranges from 169.254.0.1 up through 169.254.255.255. An EPIPA address can be called a link local address. Hosts that receive these addresses, <coughs> excuse me, can only communicate with other hosts who have an EPIPA address. Usually, when it appears, when you have an EPIPA configuration, it's because your VHCP has failed or it has been misconfigured. That's the only time that you will see an EPIPA address. Uh, and actually, you don't want to see those. That means that your network's not working very well. Now that we've covered the basics of the properties and characteristics of IPv4, let's talk about IPv6. So IPv6 is the answer to the question of what do we do about running out of IPv4 addresses? Well, we will use IPv6 because it will provide enough IP addresses for the foreseeable future. Shortly after IPv4's creation, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, the IANA, discovered or realized that pretty in pretty short order they would run out of IPv4 address addresses. So to preserve it they created the private IPv4 address spaces and they started working on the replacement for IPv4. So they started working on IPv5. Well they discovered in short order that IPv IPv5, or version 5, was not going to be sufficient. IPv5, by the way, would have been a 64-bit addressing scheme, but they discovered that it wasn't going to work. So they started working on IPv6. They scrapped IPv5. We've never seen it in the wild. They started working on IPv6, and they're pretty confident with good reason, mind you, that IPv6 would be sufficient for many, many, many years to come. Why is that? Well, so IPv6 also works at layer 3 of the OSI model, just like IPv4 does. And it too, it too uh, defines network portions and host portions in its addressing scheme. But IPv6 is a 128-bit binary addressing scheme. Uh, that's a lot. The 128 bits are grouped together into sets, with each set being separated by colons. Um, each set is two bytes long. A byte is eight bits, by the way. So. To make it easier to read, because you would get awfully tired of saying 00100000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
an IPv6 address is eight sets of four hexadecimal numbers, each being separated by a colon. And there we have an IPv6 address, kind of. And I'll get to the reason why it's kind of later. But you'll notice that there are not enough sets in this number, this representation, but we do have a set of double colons. And I will explain that later. IPv6 gives us over 340 undecillion addresses. And just so you know, undecillion is a rather large number. That's 2 to the 128th power, which is roughly equal to 340 times 10 to the 36th power. And there's the actual number right down there below, and there is no way that I'm going to read that to you because I'm not even sure how to. So let's talk about the address structure. The IPv6 address structure is a little bit different than IPv4. First off, every device receives two addresses a locally significant address, and a globally unique address. Quick way to tell the difference. Let's go back here. This address that you see to your right, that is a globally unique address, or it would be if I hadn't made it up. And that's because it starts with a 2001. Uh, your globally unique addresses always begin, well, will fall within the range of 2000 up through 3999 in that first set of hexadecimal numbers. Always. Those are globally unique. If something else is there, then it's not a globally unique number. Your locally unique address always begins with an FE80. So FE80 always denotes a locally unique address. If it doesn't begin with SE80, then it's not a local address. So let's talk about the address structure a little bit more. Uh, the first 64 bits on the right always represents uh, the local network and the last six Actually, no, the first 64 bits on the left always represent the local no network. The last 64 bits on the right always represent the host. So you can split that 128 bits right down the middle, and you will have um, how it's split. The local address, the host address, always follows the unique the extended unique identifier or EUI 64 format. Your 48-bit MAC address is actually split in half and it's padded with 16 extra bits in the middle to give you the 64 bits that make up the host address. If it's a global address, well, yeah, there we go. If it's a global address, the host address is always the last 64 bits. The network portion, that's the 64 bits, the last 64 bits on the right, excuse me, make up the host address. The first 64 bits on the left make up, kind of make up the network portion. Uh, it's actually composed of a routing prefix and a subnet. So the way that works is you will see uh, IPv6 address where you will see some hexadecimal numbers and then it will be like a slash 96. What that slash 96 means is that the last 96 bits to the right make up the uh, prefix and the host address and to 12, the first 12 bits, no, not 12, 32 bits, excuse me, make up the network portion. 
Uh, that's because it follows the classless interdomain routing convention. And your host address is follows the same at, same aspects as before. So let's talk about the writing out IPv6. So the 128-bit nature of IPv6 makes it rather cumbersome to write up, and it actually takes up unnecessary space within systems and files. When you are writing out an IPv6 address, you can drop any leading zeros that are in a set. So any set that begins with a zero, you can drop any leading zeros as long as you leave one of the zeros in place. Actually, you don't even need to do that as long as there is a digit in the octet. If you have any set of consecutive zeros, that single set of consecutive zeros can be replaced by a double colon. If you look down below, here's my example. Remember that that IPv6 address that I showed way back here, right there. Well, here we're going to work through it. So you start with the 2001 colon 0db8, yada, 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 yada. You drop all the leading zeros. That gives you 2001 colon db8 colon 0 colon 0 colon 0 colon ff00, so on and so forth. Now, you can remove any single consecutive sets of zeros, which gives us the 2001 colon db8 colon colon. See, that's where we replace those consecutive groups of zero. FF00 colon 42 colon 8329. Now, a word of caution about the double colon. Like I said, any single set of zeros, consecutive zeros, can be represented by the double colon. Do not use the double colon more than once. You will confuse everybody. IPv6 is always 128 bits. Always. If you put in, if you had two different consecutive sets of zeros, so you put in two, two double colons, your system would not know how many zeros to put into which space where the double colon is. So always use a single set of a single instance of the double colon when replacing consecutive sets of zero. Thrilling, huh? Okay. IPv6 is the more robust and versatile addressing scheme but IPv4 is not going any away anywhere soon. Why is that? Well, because we've been using it for a couple of decades. And IT, even though it's a rather fast-paced industry, is rather loath to change things. We just don't like changing things. Uh, why is IPv6 the more versatile? Well, because we get 340 over 340 undecacillion possible IPv addresses, IPv6 addresses. That is enough addresses for every device to have multiple unique addresses for every person everywhere the world over. IPv6 is also easier to configure than IPv4 because it actually auto-configures itself rather well. It doesn't use DHCP in order, it doesn't need DHCP in order to do it. There is DHCP version 6, but that also is a webinar for a different day. Actually, I've already done that one. So if you can find the posting of that, you can watch it and you'll find out about DHCP version 6. But like I said before, IPv4 is not going anywhere, going away. Going away anytime soon just because of its popularity. 
So let's talk about some more of the differences about between IPv4 and IPv6. I already said it, IPv6 is easier to manage, uh, specifically without DHCP. It uses a discovery process and it can auto-discover uh, what network it's on both locally and globally and it can auto-discover what its host address is. Uh, makes it a whole lot easier to do. Uh, both IPv6 and IPv4 have loopback addresses. Loopback addresses are used for troubleshooting. IPv4 uses 127 127.0.0.1. IPv6 uses colon, colon, one. A lot easier to remember. Each IPv6 device or interface will only receive a single IPv4 address. Well, if you're running IPv6, each device or interface will receive at least two IPv6 addresses, one that's globally unique and one that's unique on the local network. There is an exception to that, but that, like I said earlier, is for a different day. IPv6 has three clearly defined private IP address spaces, while IPv6 does not have any private IP address spaces. Well, they do kind of, but they're not relevant here because that would be the unique local addresses that are created. IPv6 is a 32-bit binary number addressing scheme. IPv6 is 128 bits. In the long run, IPv6 will take over the world. It will become the clear winner, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. So in the meantime, you need to learn how to work with both. Uh, IPv4 and IPv6 and just remember that currently in most networks IPv4 is the much more common addressing scheme. I want to thank you for watching tonight's webinar.